Say, a leading think tank in Mexico, is hosting the Social Mobility Summit 2016. Some of the world's main experts will come together to discuss and help establish a broad agenda for research and policy making. Follow us via live streaming at socialmobilitysummit.org. Good morning and welcome to Mexico. We are very happy to have you all here at uh, the Social Mobility Summit uh, 2016, organized by uh, Central Studios Espinosa Iglesias, uh, C-E-E-Y, by its um, letters. And um, we are very happy to, uh, to welcome you and to be able to hear you what you have to say about uh, uh, major issues in social mobility. And um, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our um, uh, board member, uh, Julio Serrano, who has been instrumental in developing the topic of uh, social mobility at, at the center. Actually, uh, he's the proposer and co-founder of the center with the idea of studying social mobility in Mexico. Um, so I'm very pleased to, to uh, invite him here. And just before I do, just uh, to say that Marcelo de la Jara, whom you had a lot of conversations through mail, perhaps um, thank you very much, Marcelo, for uh, chairing this steering committee for organizing the, the summit. And to the rest of the staff that uh, make this uh, possible, thank you very much. So Julio Serrano, please uh, come in and uh, give us a your welcome. Welcome to all of you to the first uh, summit on social mobility in Mexico. I know that many of you come from far away and um, thank you for taking the time and effort to come to, to Mexico. Um, social mobility is a fascinating and important subject. And we at SAE are excited to host this event. This event. The, the purpose of these conferences is to bring together some of the world's experts on social mobility in order to facilitate a broad and interdisciplinary dialogue which results in a wide agenda for research and policy making. Established by the Espinosa Rugarcia Foundation, SAE is an independent, not for profit research center. Its mission is to do research and generate information on social mobility and socioeconomic well-being in Mexico. Its goal is to carry out high-level analysis and, disse and disseminate it among citizens and policymakers in order to provide them with strategies to increase opportunity and social mobility among the Mexican populations. SAE seeks to incorporate social mobility to the public policy agenda at all levels of government in Mexico. It hasn't been easy. In our country, social mobility is seldom discussed and not well understood. When the government talks about social problems, it, con it concentrates on poverty and inequality. Social mobility is not even in the radar screen. Accordingly, social programs are aimed almost exclusively at fighting poverty and inequality. To the government, for the government to focus on social mobility, it is necessary to generate information and periodical measurements reflecting the improvements or lack of thereof setbacks in the different dimensions of social mobility. Only with a systematic social mobility research effort will the government be provided with the necessary tools to incorporate the subject and promote equal opportunities for the Me Mexican population. SEI, which as Enrique said, stands for, in Spanish, for the Spanish acronym Espinosa Iglesias Research Center, has published three collective works of papers on social mobility based on two nationally representative studies that were conducted in 2006 and 2011. These national studies were the first of its kind in Mexico. Before 2006, there wasn't any national measurement of social mobility in Mexico. Additionally, and based on the last survey that we did in 2011, a report on social mobility to inform policymakers was published in 2013. These research results 
have been shared widely across the academic, academic, government, and business sectors in order to increase the awareness, again, about the low degrees of social mobility in Mexico, which I'm going to talk about this afternoon. A new national representat representative survey will be conducted in 2017, next year, which is going to generate a lot of data and which we hope uh, could uh, help or could, could be used by some of you to uh, do uh, some research. A few words about the schedule for this um, conference. The first day, today, will be devoted to an academic discussion on social mobility, including recent findings on new theories and methods. The second day, representatives from international organizations, think tanks, and government officials will discuss public policies and social actions that promote social mobility around the world. Just to finish up, I hope you have a pleasant stay and productive stay in Mexico, and I look forward to hearing your presentations. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Mariana Becerra. It's a pleasure to be here today. Session one is about to begin, so I would like to invite the speakers to pass to the front. David Grosky, please. Miles Korak, Gregory Clark, and Anders Jörglund. The session is entitled, What We Have Learned from Social Mobility Research. The table is going to be moderated by Roberto Vélez, who is a member of SEI, and he is going to give you the specifics and the rules for the, for the next table. Thank you. I will present them in the order that I'm going to present. Uh, first of all, we have David Groski here. David is a uh, Barbara Kimball Browning Professor in the School of Humanities and Science at Stanford University. He's also the director of the Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality and co-editor of, of Pathways Magazine. His research addresses the changing structure of late industrial poverty, mobility, and inequality. And his recent books include Social Stratification, Occupy the Future, among others. He's also, I have to say that, a member of the Social Mobility Advisors Committee uh, here at SAE. Miles Korak is a full professor of economics with the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs uh, in the University of o Ottawa. His publications focus on labor markets and social policy, including child poverty, access to university education, social mobility, and unemployment. He has edited three books, and his recent paper, Equality of Opportunity and Intergenerational Mobility, examines the relationship between inequality and social mobility across countries, a relationship that has become known as the so-called Great Gatsby Curve. Gregory Clark is professor of economics at UC Davis and editor of the European Review of Economic History, chair of the steering committee of the all uh, UC group in economic history, and a research associate of the Center for Poverty Research at Davis. He, his main current research is on the history and nature of social mobility. Uh, his most recent book, The Sun Also Rises, Surnames in the History of Social Mobility, uh, by the way, will be published in Spanish by SEI. And Anders Björglund is professor of economics at, at the Swedish Institute for Social Research at Stockholm University since 1990. He's currently working on earnings mobility, the economics of the family, and in particular, intergenerational mobility and role of family background. Among others, he has published in journals such as American Economic Review, European Economic Review, and Review of Economics and Statistics. So that's the kind of level we have here. And we are very pleased to have you all here. And please, David, we can start with you. Thank you. You, you can stay there or you can come as a tourist. So it's a real, real pleasure, pleasure to be here and, and much thanks for, for, for inviting me. It's, it's, it's especially nice to be here in these, among friends in these, in these trying times. So I'll get right to it. Uh, the topic of this, of this uh, panel is what have we learned from social mobility. I'm going to flip that a bit and ask instead, what do we need to learn? I hope you'll allow me that. 
uh, slight change. Uh, and, and I think that the backdrop to all this is within the U.S. there's, there's uh, rising concerns that there might be a decline in, in social mobility. Uh, and my, my view is that we haven't met those rising concerns with, with, uh, with the kind of scholarship that I would have hoped we could have met those rising concerns. Uh, uh, and, and, and there are two main problems that I see that have, have made it more difficult for us as scholars to take on these concerns, more difficult than I would like. And the first is that we, we don't well understand the sources of change. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But then, and I would say most importantly, there's a real data deficit in the US uh, uh, that's made it difficult for us to, to examine whether or not indeed there's been a decline in, in mobility as some have, have suggested. So I'll, I'll take on those two, those two points in turn. Let me begin with, with the need to uh, think, I would argue more exhaustively about why there is a decline in, why there may be a decline in social mobility. And there's been a lot of, lot of important arguments about possible sources of decline that are in play, but I want to add to the mix one further argument that I think is worthy of, of consideration. Uh, and I'm going to call this the commodification of opportunity hypothesis. And, and the claim is a very simple one. It's that money is increasingly needed to buy opportunity. Opportunities for sale in the US increasingly. Uh, and that, that, that brings about a, a new set of problems that we need to, need to think about. And so the implication, if, if indeed opportunity is increasingly for sale in the US, the implication is that the poor are doubly disadvantaged. Of course, they now have, in relative terms, less money than those at the top by virtue of rising income inequality. But in addition to that, they increasingly need money for the purposes of buying opportunity for their kids. So that's, that's the argument. So I want you to imagine if you're, you're poor, and as is not surprising, you want to do the best by your children. You want to afford them opportunities. You want them to be upwardly mobile. Uh, and so then think about the sorts of problems that you face when you're a poor parent uh, in this, I would argue, highly commodified world. So I'm just going to give you a few examples because I want to move on to the data deficit argument. But let me give you a few examples of the sorts of problems that I think are, are perhaps new problems that, that, that poor parents face in, in trying to secure upward mobility for their kids. First one is, is, is that of getting married. Uh, and you, know, you might say, well, why, why does that matter? Well, you would want a second income stream, right? Uh, so that you can smooth out income uh, shocks over, over time. Uh, also, of course, having a, a, a partner will make childcare much easier. There's all sorts of reasons, and it's well established why, why there's there are benefits uh, with respect to, to affording opportunities for your kids if you have, if you have a, a partner. Uh, but the problem is, as shown in this, this graph here, is that marriage is increasingly a luxury good. It's meted out on the basis of whether or not you can, in effect, buy it. Uh, that is, if you have a good future earning stream, as indicated by your educational investments, then you're much more likely uh, to, to, to get married uh, than is the case for those who have uh, a less substantial uh, expected earning stream. And that kind of gap between those, 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 those folks who have good future earning streams and those who don't is growing in time. And that's the sense in which marriage is a luxury good, uh, and, it, and it makes it more difficult for, for poor parents to, 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 to buy opportunities for their kids. Now, what might they want to buy? Well, we know now from lots of important research by, by, by Raj Chetty and others that it's really important to be in a high opportunity neighborhood, a neighborhood that makes upward mobility possible. So for example, high quality schooling is, is typically found in, in high end neighborhoods in the US. Uh, and that, that's an important amenity that, that you, would, you would want for your kid if you want to get ahead. But the problem is, the problem is that it's increasingly difficult in the US to win the lottery as a poor person and get into a high-end neighborhood that, that has then high quality public schools. So it used to be the case, say, in, 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 in the neighborhood right outside Stanford University, Palo Alto, that if you were working class, you could actually win the lottery from time to time, get an apartment in, in Palo Alto, and then, by virtue of, of living in Palo Alto, have access to very high quality public schools that would then be be, be uh, an engine for mobility. That doesn't happen anymore, right? Palo Alto, like all other rich communities, or many other, most other rich communities in the US, are, are, are populated much more so than in the past by other rich folks. And likewise, poor neighborhoods are, are much more 
uh, homogeneous. They're populated mainly by, by, by poor people. And, and that means we basically priced neighborhoods at the, at the cost of their amenities more aggressively than in the past. There's no lottery for, for working class folks to get into, into high-end neighborhoods. Uh, rather, you just got to pay for it. And that's the commodification of, of in this case, neighborhoods. And, and by virtue of, of that type of commodification of, of opportunity as well. So, so the upshot is that I would argue that there are two big forces at work, both of which are troubling if you care about social mobility. One is, of course, rising income inequality. There's been a lot written about that, and there's, there's good reasons to, to worry, and Miles and others have laid this out. Uh, good reason to, to, to possibly worry about rising income inequality. But, but what gives rising income inequality its, its, its teeth is, I would argue, commodification. That is, uh, this is what, what makes money matter. Uh, and increasingly, you need it in order to, to buy opportunity for your kids. So that's all I'm going to say on, on, as regards the deficit with respect to thinking about the sorts of forces that are afoot uh, that, that, might, that might make mobility more difficult. I want to move now to the other big problem uh, that, that I think has, has led, has, has made it more difficult for us to take on these increasing worries about, about declining, possibly declining mobility, and that's an evidence deficit. So there are lots of theories of change in play, like, like the one that I just, just laid out, the commodification opportunity, but we've had difficulty assessing them by virtue of this evidence deficit. And I want to, I want to quote Richard Reeves here. Uh, the debate about social mobility and equality of opportunity is still unbalanced. The evidence base is too fragile for much of the political weight placed upon it. We need more data. So I just want to lay out what I think we should do in response to, to, to this problem in the, in the US. So I'll talk about two projects that are, that, are, that are motivated by this desire to take on this evidence deficit. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll lay out each in, each in turn. So let me start with, with, with uh, the Statistics of Income Occupation Project. This is uh, a collaboration with the Statistics of Income Unit of the IRS and, and the Census Bureau, and there are many, many folks involved. Uh, Michelle Jackson, who's here, uh, Michael Hout, and many, many others. And what, 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 what is the problem that we're, we're taking on here? Uh, I would think one problem is that in the US in particular, the study of occupation mobility and the study of, of earnings and income mobility tend to be quite balkanized pursuits. Uh, uh, there's one class of scholars who, who study occupation mobility, another who study uh, uh, earnings and, and income mobility. Uh, and those two, two approaches aren't typically brought together. Uh, you might blame disciplinary balkanization on that, but I think even more important is that we just don't have the data that, that it would allow us to bring, bring those two types of study together. And that's really problematic uh, because one can imagine trade-offs being made between those, between those two types of, of outcomes, occupation and income, uh, uh, in ways that make it difficult to get a good assessment of, say, trends in mobility without, without examining both at the same time. But the problem, as I said, is we don't have a large data set uh, that, that, that simultaneously ascertains occupation and income. Difficult though it may be to believe that that's the case, it is. Uh, and so what, what can one do about it? Well, in fact, on Form 1040 that people in the US fill out uh, when, they, when they file their taxes, they are asked, you can see those fields there, those, those ones in, in pink, they are asked their occupation, their own occupation and that of their, that of their, uh, their spouse. Uh, but these have never been exploited by the IRS. They're just alphabetic fields, uh, and they have been exploited in part because it's, it's costly to, to, to code them. And so this is what we're doing. Uh, we're taking the tax return data, of course, behind a firewall, linking it to the American Community Survey and the Current Population Survey, both of which have fully coded occupation data. And so then we can use machine learning to, to develop an algorithm that will allow us to code those alphabetic titles that are present in the, in the tax return data uh, to code them using conventional uh, uh, standard occupation classification. And then once that algorithm is developed, we can, we can, then, we can then apply it uh, to the tax return data and, and ultimately, 
ultimately be able to carry out analyses that take into account both types of mobility at once. So that's one, one infrastructural project that I think will help solve this, this, this data deficit. Um, but note that it won't help us much when it comes to examining long-term trends in mobility, which is the topic about which many of us care, uh, uh, because the, 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 the population tax returns in the US are only available uh, in electronic form starting in 1996, uh, which is too late to examine the sorts of trends that, that about which we care. And the available uh, survey-based panels are, are, are very small in the US. I mean, there are many folks in this room who have been extraordinarily ingenious, Bosch and others, extraordinarily ingenious in, in trying to extract what, what one can from, from these small uh, survey-based panels. But there are, there are inevitable limits uh, uh, imposed by, by the constraints of sample size. And it's been difficult as a result to, 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 to be sure about what the, what the long-term trends are. So what's the solution? In fact, the US has a massive unassembled panel. And so the, the solution is to assemble it. So what do I mean by that? Well, every 10 years, uh, a decennial census is administered in the, in the US. It's a cross-section, right? But we have the capacity to convert those cross-sections into a panel by linking over time so that we can identify folks who, who are, are present across, across those multiple surveys. You can do so with a name, address, and, 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 and birth date. Uh, that, that makes the linkage possible. Of course, all of this happens behind the firewall, uh, behind, within the context of, 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 of uh, uh, the census firewall so that there, there's no possibility of any breach. Uh, once those linkages are made, uh, then, 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 then we have a a panel that's converted out of out of cross-sectional data. So this is what this is what in the end one could imagine building in the U.S. You link 1960 through through present-day censuses, also the American Community Survey, same process. Uh, ideally, under some circumstances, it might be possible also to link those data to to earnings reports and 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 and, and tax returns. And then, ideally, under some some conditions and constraints, one could additionally link those data to, to uh, various types of program data. Again, all behind the firewall uh, so that no breaches are possible. And all analyses would, of course, only be based on those data that are needed and would only be undertaken by, by highly qualified people and, and when it's in the country's interest to, to carry out that research. So we're working with the Census Bureau, and it's a big team of folks, again, uh, uh, part of a National Academy of Science panel uh, that's working with, with the Census Bureau to solve some of the technical problems that are encountered in building this, this infrastructure. And when you go to the past censuses in order to build this population frame, and the idea would be to have a population frame for, for all folks in, in, in the US, uh, that then could be used to, again, hang tax data on, hang administrative data on, and have the, the opportunity to, to, to then carry out long-run analyses of, of social mobility. Uh, to do that, to make that possible, you have to digitize the names. In the early censuses, like the 1990 census, you just have the alphabetic name. Now, when, when censuses are, are, are in the public domain, like, say, the, the uh, 1940 census, um, when they're in the public domain, uh, what's been done actually is that folks have gone to places where labor costs are low, like China, and had them hand keyed, and that's tractable uh, because labor costs are so low. Uh, but that could never happen with, with, with censuses that are not in the public domain. Uh, uh, and so there has to be another solution to digitizing names. Uh, and so we've had a competition uh, that was run uh, in collaboration with, with the Census Bureau, again, behind the firewall. And this isn't a real, I should say, this isn't real. This isn't a real uh, uh, piece of output from the census. It's just a, 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 a rendition of, of the kinds of data that you have, uh, because we're not behind the firewall. Um, but what, 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 what we did was have a competition between different companies that use OCR to convert these, these, these alphabetics into, 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 
into what we need. And and it turned out that the that the kind of the cutting edge firms, the ones that use deep 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 learning, actually were able to very successfully digitize. And so this is technically possible. Uh, and that was that was sort of the big technical challenge about which many people worried, and, and it can be solved. And so this is technically possible. Lots of other hurdles, but it's technically possible. So let's say it all happens. What would then be possible with this kind of uh, infrastructure? Well, first off, we can examine long-run trend in mobility. And in fact, we're using pieces of this infrastructure that are already available in the, in the more toward the present day, 2000 census linked to current ACSs, to look at recent trends in mobility. But once we have earlier censuses coded and linked, it will be possible to use, use them for the purposes of examining long-run trend in mobility. Note that because the census uh, has measurements of racial and ethnic, ethnic status, it, it will be possible, unlike with the, with the tax data, it will be possible to examine racial and ethnic differences in mobility, which is very important. Also, we'll have very high quality representations of family effects available uh, because you have traces of, of, of one's family situation through a variety of different data sources. So for example, co-residents in the census will tell you about, if you will, social parenthood, but then insofar as tax data can also be, be, be used and linked, uh, uh, you would also have evidence of, of what might be called financial parenthood as, as well, namely whether or not you claim that child as a dependent. And those measurements would be possible over time. So you could see how family complexity plays out and its implications for mobility. And that's just a small sampling of what could be done. We would finally, in a country that purports to care about mobility in the United States, we'd finally be able to actually monitor it in a, in a rigorous and aggressive way. Now I want to talk about some of the other assets of this type of linkage effort. It's not just a uh, an infrastructure that would make it possible to, to monitor basic labor market processes like social mobility, but it would also be an extraordinary resource for program evaluation. And it will fundamentally change, I would argue, how we evaluate policy and programs in the US. I want to give you a few examples of that side benefit, if you will, of this type of infrastructure. So one of the, one of the uh, important findings coming out of decades of, of program evaluation and policy evaluation research is that you have to tend to the long run. And that these short, one-off studies um, uh, that we typically undertake because it's prohibitively expensive to attempt a long-run assessment of a program effect, these short assessments can be very misleading. Why are they mi misleading? Sometimes there's washout of effects. That is effects that that we see in the short run just disappear. Uh, and and uh, if we make an assessment based on the short run alone, we might think that a program or, or, or policy is, is extremely uh, consequential. But, but, but in fact, by virtue of washout, uh, we would be wrong had we had access to the long run effects. So that's one type of problem. But there's also a problem on the other, other end of, of, of so-called sleeper effects, that is, effects that don't emerge in the short term and if you terminated your study in the short term, you would then think there is no effect, but in fact, they, the, the, the effects do emerge over, over the longer haul. And, and so that's another example of why you need long-run assessments. This kind of infrastructure that I discussed will allow for just that assessment to take place uh, because you will have linked data representing the full population of the US from 1960 to the present day. And so programs like, say, early childhood programs uh, uh, that were in play very early on can, can be assessed in terms of the long-run effects. That's one, one sort of advantage that, that, that would obtain with this type of infrastructure. A second is intergenerational effects. So the other, the other big conclusion coming out of, out of decades of, of, of evaluation research is that you really have to tend to the intergenerational effect. So for example, in evaluating the earned income tax credit in the US, what's now been found is that yes, there are important, important effects on, on the recipients themselves, the parents who are getting the earned income tax credit, but there are also arguably even more important effects on their children. Children are benefited in all sorts of ways by, by growing up in households that had that additional income stream. Uh, and, and it leads then to mobility, for example, on the part of the children. And if you don't have a capacity to, 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 
to see that intergenerational effect, you're going to have very misleading understanding of, 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 of the program and its, and its, and its consequences. Here's a third example. Because this will be a very large data set representing the full population of the US and how it's changed over time, uh, we'll be able to, to, to be consistent with another iron law of program evaluation. And that's that effects are very heterogeneous across different subpopulations, across different, uh, across different areas and regions. And, and it's difficult, though, to understand that heterogeneity when you have the typical very small study. Uh, but with this sort of uh, uh, infrastructure, we'll, in fact, be able to, 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 to examine these heterogeneous effects. Final example of what you can do, and I'm just giving you a sampling of what could be done. I think this will revolutionize our, our capacity to evaluate programs and policies. But as a final example, you can carry out embedded experiments. I want to, I'll give you one example of what, what I mean by this. We're collaborating uh, with uh, Y Combinator research to carry out a, a, a big, massive net basic income experiment, uh, like some carried out in other countries and a few in the US, but a big massive basic income experiment in, in, in the US. Uh, and this can all be embedded in the administrative infrastructure, which is already to some extent available in California. And so this will happen in California, at least in the pilot form. And, and what you can do is observe how the recipients of the basic income change their behavior in terms of what their, what their tax filings are, what their earnings reports are, and also, also behavior that, 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 that might be picked up in the ACS or, or even decennial census over, over the long haul. So all of this can happen unobtrusively. It can happen very cheaply and efficiently uh, because you're simply, simply uh, with, of course, the consent of the participants, uh, tracking, tracking uh, their behavior through unobtrusive administrative outcomes. Reduces the cost of experiments. Uh, it allows one to have a very large control group and therefore increase the power of the experiments. Uh, and I think it will, here again, revolutionize how we, how we deliver experiments. So this is all by way of talking about what we're doing in the US to try to repair the data deficit that we face. It's, I think, a scandal that in a country that purports to care about mobility, we haven't had the capacity to monitor trends very successfully. But so uh, what do we do in the absence of that capacity? Well, we make do. Uh, and, and, and as I said, there are a lot of folks here who have been very ingenious in trying to make do uh, with what we have. I want to give you one example of, of what we're forced to do, what we're forced to do in, in the US to try, for example, to make assessments about long run trend, uh, how we try to rely on US ingenuity to overcome the data deficit. Uh, it's not where we want to be, but it's where we are. So I'll give you one example of, of, of the situation in which we find ourselves and how we try to deal with it. What if you cared about what if you cared about trends in absolute mobility? Pretty important measure, one might think, of, of, of how we're faring as a country in terms of delivering mobility, namely whether or not children are making more than their parents, right? Just a very simple assessment of whether or not children, say at age 30, are making as much as their parents were when the parents were age 30. And you might well think that parents, that children care pretty deeply about that type of comparison, about how they're faring relative, relative to their parents. You'd, you'd think we would have a long-run assessment of this, very basic measure, but in fact, we don't. We don't because we don't have the big panel running over a long time period that would, that would be needed in order to undertake that assessment. So what, 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 are, what are we doing to try to overcome that problem? Well, I'm, I'm, I, I'm working on a project with Raj Chetty, uh, Nathan Hendren, Robert Manduka, uh, Jimmy Narang, and Max Hell to try to overcome this problem and if you're willing to make a big assumption, you can actually get long-run assessments of trends in absolute mobility. You just need three types of information. Just three types of information. You need the income distributions of the children when they're age 30, and that's available from current population surveys. You need the income distributions of parents also when they're age 30, and that's available from, from decennial censuses. And then you need the copula that tells how that one distribution is converted in, into the other. Now, what's the big assumption that you need to make? Well, that the copula is stable, because we know what the copula is in the present day, but we don't know what it is in the past. But if you're willing to assume that it's stable, 
then you can use those three pieces of information to, 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 to generate uh, uh, estimates of trend in absolute mobility. And so that's what we're, what we're, what we're doing. Here's, here's the transition matrix of copula close up. It's a 100 by 100 matrix. It just tells you how, how folks uh, who are born into a particular percentile, uh, how, they, how they end up. And so if you're so lucky, say, to be born into the, into the very top percentile, you're not so luck, likely to end up in the, the bottom five percentiles, 0.20 or so probability. Uh, but you are, as you see on the far right, quite likely to end up in the top, one of the top five percentiles. Those percentages are much higher. So that's all the copula does. If you're willing to assume that it's stable, and this, this, this was estimated, say, by uh, Raj Teddy, Nathan Hendren, and others uh, from present day tax data, if you're willing to, to project that into the past, you're good to go. And indeed, we've done that. Now, it gets a little bit better than that, because in fact, you can show that given the sorts of margins, the parent distributions and the child distributions that prevailed in the distant past, say in the 1940 birth cohort, it doesn't even matter what the copula is. That is, no matter what the copula happens to be, you're going to get roughly the same estimates of, of, of absolute mobility. So in this case, the marginal distributions are determinative. Uh, and by luck, as it were, we can carry out estimates. We can complete estimates of long-run trend in absolute mobility without even knowing the copula in the past. You don't need to make the stable copula subject. Now, it turns out that the distributions, the marginal distributions in the present day don't have that same quality. So you do need to know the copula. But as luck would have it, we know the copula in the present day. So we lucked out. So we can actually make, with, with a high degree of reliability, we, could, we can construct a, a long-run trend in, in absolute mobility. But we were just lucky. And it shouldn't be that we have to, 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 to uh, proceed by hook and crook in order to, to get estimates of basic parameters of, of social mobility. And so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, uh, we're in a situation in the US that we ought not be in. Namely, we have a, a massive data deficit. It drives us to, 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 to do things that, that uh, one has to do in the absence of the requisite data. But, but what we really need to be doing, I would argue, job one is to develop the data infrastructure that allows us to, to, to estimate the most basic parameters of mobility. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Now is the turn for Miles. I, 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 uh, one thing I, I forgot to say is that by the end of the presentation, we will have some time for some questions. Thank you. So it's certainly a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to share this time with so many interesting uh, people. Um, but it's um, a particular pleasure to follow the talk um, by, by David, who's spoken about the importance of um, assessing changes in mobility through time. I think the way I'll frame my discussion is the importance of um, framing mobility um, through differences across space. So I, I think I want to leave you with uh, three mes major messages. I understand my task is to sort of uh, speak to uh, colleagues in the research community on what we've learned and uh, through the work I'm doing. Um, and I'm going to use that to suggest sort of what we still can uh, learn. That can't be divorced from how we learn things, which you saw in David's presentation had a lot to do with the development of new data, and I'll strike that theme as well. Uh, we need to continue to make uh, cross-country comparisons, um, but we're, we're moving, I think, into a space in which that is going to be done much more finely, and it has to be done much more judiciously. The second thing I, th I think we need to do is to re-engage theorists in this discussion about intergenerational um, mobility. There needs to be a little bit um, more support or more discipline to help empiric empiricists make sense of different statistics. And currently, as economic theory stands, it's not very helpful in speaking to the concerns about process, about equality of opportunity. Our standard utilitarian framework that welfare economics is based on is all about outcomes and welfare, and income doesn't necessarily directly fit in, into that. And if we're concerned about process, um, uh, how would you m imagine welfare being measured, and what statistics reflect that? 
And then I think the third theme I wanted to leave you with is the one that David so aptly uh, emphasized, the continued need for um, the development of data, uh, but also I would add access to data. That has to certainly be uh, a part of this agenda. So in sum, I see this literature, and I've sort of been engaged with it um, almost for the last 25 years um, since being influenced by Gary Solon's uh, terribly important work in the uh, early 1990s, as a conversation between three parties, between um, the theory of, 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 um, uh, of behavior and of measurement, uh, between in, in empiricists uh, and those who develop data, and thirdly, between the um, policy needs of citizens and policy makers. And it's in that three-way dance that this literature uh, develops. I think we're on the cusp of, of uh, the need for other parties to, to sort of take the lead in that dance. So maybe I can, if those are my major messages, maybe I can motivate the discussion with uh, two pictures. Uh, this is one that um, uh, you may have seen in which uh, the major message is that intergenerational uh, mobility, at least in earnings or incomes, varies across countries. So I've ordered countries here in the vertical dimension according to the intergenerational earnings elasticity. And to be truthful, this is just uh, between fathers and sons. So that's a whole other side issue of more fully incorporating uh, uh, both genders into this literature. And I've ordered the countries also uh, horizontally. Uh, as you move from left to right, the degree of cross-sectional inequality changes. All right? So the major message that sort of came out of this flurry of work is that there's a good deal of variation between uh, countries in terms of intergenerational mobility. And what we've learned from that, I think, is a couple of things. One, to make judicious comparisons. All right? I don't think it really makes sense to imagine countries sliding up and down uh, uh, this uh, relationship just by changing the degree of, uh, of, of inequality. And in some dimensions, um, um, the degree of mobility sort of reflects a value judgment, a, um, a degree to which um, societies draw the line between families, markets, and state in influencing the capacities of children. It, it, it may be uh, also for very fundamental structural reasons that the United States can never or ever want to become like a Denmark. So there's a need here for judicious comparisons in terms of understanding what aspects of the capacity of children to uh, move up the ladder, uh, both in terms of um, uh, their, their skill sets, their personalities, but also the distance between the rungs of those ladders that are embedded in labor markets. What aspects of those are policy relevant uh, for different countries? Okay? Um, the other thing that, that we've learned from this is the overall intergenerational elasticity seems to be sort of a, a long run gradient. We also have a concern for the many short term gradients that uh, add up to a earnings correlation across uh, generations. The gradient that influences early childhood development, the gradient between parental background that determines access to quality primary and secondary school, the gradient between parental background that also determines in this recursive process access to post-secondary uh, schooling. The hierarchies in the labor market that influence the places uh, that children can find themselves in uh, because of the knowledge, information, or specific skills that they get from their parents. And so there's a whole, uh, there's a whole series of research agenda wrapped up in this overall uh, uh, intergenerational elasticity that the literature has really uh, moved forward on. And granted, it can be very hard speaking of long-term trends, but if we have a sense of this causal process, we can highlight the specific um, short-term transitions that are be being made that can also sort of hint at what's coming down the road for a generation that's being raised in an era of higher inequality. So countries do differ, but we should be judicious in our comparisons. There are differences between countries, but the second picture I, I want to motivate this discussion with 
is the variation within countries. And so I've taken, uh, I've taken this data from um, the website that uh, Raj Chetty and his colleagues uh, have developed as a part of their research agenda, the qualityofopportunity.org website, and I've refashioned it to, to map the commuting zones in the United States according to um, the chances that a child born to bottom quintile parents will move to the top quintile. So this is the rags to riches movement that is at the uh, core of the um, so-called uh, um, American uh, dream. And the really important um, di direction that this research um, has highlighted is the fact that there's a good deal of variation within the country. And so that perhaps then it's more important to make comparisons within a nation state uh, than between, okay? Because here, presumably within this the, this country border, and I excuse the fact that I don't have Alaska and Hawaii uh, uh, in, this, in this picture. Uh, there is a sense of shared uh, uh, values on, on what we mean by uh, the good life, uh, by the American dream. And so what are the core influences driving the differences becomes the research agenda, and how can we learn from that? You can see where I'm going to go. The next volley in this research will be making within compare, country of Paris comparisons across uh, countries. All right. I sort of also want to put a, a note of caution to this. If we just focus on within country variations, sometimes our policy imaginations can be limited. We take for um, the, um, uh, the systemic uh, or uh, factors that are simply given and hidden um, uh, issues that could be different, all right? So if we take, for example, the structure of labor markets to be a constant or the structure of schooling uh, to be as variable as it is in the U.S. and the structure of financing to be given, then maybe we can only imagine mobility as an option, that the poor should have the capacity to move somewhere where there's more opportunity rather than appreciating that maybe some of those deep systemic things are also uh, uh, policy uh, choices. So what have we learned? Social mobility varies across countries, but we should be judicious. We have to appreciate the reasons and the drivers. That's why theory is very important uh, in all of this. It helps us then to understand the possibilities for public policy. And so we've learned that social mobility uh, varies within countries and that these comparisons can expand possibilities for public policy. All right, as I suggested, I think it's important then to appreciate how we've learned this. And we've learned it through a type of multidisciplinarity, if that, if that is the correct pronunciation of that word. Uh, and it involves a conversation between theory uh, and statistical developments. And you can see sort of the early part of this literature having relied heavily on the Becker-Tomes model and some of the um, um, uh, findings of Tony Atkinson, Stephen Jenkins, and Gary Solon, and others on the importance of different types of measurement errors. Um, in that first volley of research, uh, the United States was really at the cutting edge because it showed everybody else in the world the value of longitudinal surveys, the value of the PSID came to really shine when that panel was long enough to study generational uh, uh, issues. That was taken up, I think, by the realization in the Nordic countries that administrative data can offer great opportunities here. And so um, uh, a conversation began about data development. And now the, the US has incorporated that lesson about the importance of administrative data. And all of that discussion is always animated. In this, in this particular research, it strikes me at how, how fluid the discussion has been between research and policy. And there's been a back and forth between policy because, frankly, um, the focus that the Becker-Tomes model gives us on, inter on the intergenerational elasticity is not necessarily what policymakers want. And there was a, there's a need and a search, as, as, as Bash and others have, have outlined, for other measures, not just relative mobility, but absolute mobility, absolute mobility defined in different, uh, uh, different ways. And so we should encourage that uh, uh, conversation and I think we're at the cusp where I think um, the way forward or the, the new steps in this dance have to be the continued development of better data in many countries. 
And perhaps um, it's very heartening to hear Julio speak about that agenda being pushed forward uh, uh, in Mexico now. But that um, development of data, in my view, should be done in partnership with researchers, where researchers help drive and govern um, the development of data and its use. And this is what I think you're seeing is a, a great uh, example in, in what David has just uh, offered, uh, offered you. And access should be part of that discussion from the beginning. Finally, as I suggested, uh, we're at a stage where we have a, a, a whole series of different statistics or measures of intergenerational mobility, but we don't have the theoretical discipline to appreciate what their welfare implications are. And uh, part of that is appreciating that process matters. And so I think theorists now are starting in, in, in a small way to pick up that ball and we should encourage that, con that part of the conversation. So let me speak then about making judicious comparisons. I don't think there's any point really dwelling into all of the countries on the Great Gatsby Curve I showed you earlier, but let me focus on two countries I think in which the capacity for policy learning is really quite high and it's Canada and the US. We should look at some basic values underlying uh, what's important to each of these countries. And some years ago, uh, jointly with the Pew uh, Charitable Trust, I did a survey uh, in Canada that mimicked a survey they had done in the US on how the citizens of these countries define the American dream. And to my shock, uh, Canadians define that in almost exactly the same way as Americans. So I'm giving you here a list of a whole uh, bunch of possibilities we put to the respondents of our survey, and what fraction of them responded, I, I think was it eight or, or, or higher on a 10-point scale, that um, this is what they understand the American dream to be, or, and the, the question was obviously reworded uh, for Canadians. The only statistical difference in this is um, Americans, I think, uh, appear to be more entrepreneurial uh, than, than Canadians. Uh, starting your own business is sort of valued as an aspect uh, of the dream. But basically, um, these point estimates are almost uh, uh, spot on uh, with each other and there are no statistical differences. And so that suggests that these countries both want to go to the same place. The good life means something. That's what I'll take it to be. And so that's what I mean by a judicious comparison. If we both share similar policy goals, then why are outcomes so different? And so here's that map redrawn for uh, two countries in the North American sphere. And so you can see that I'm imagining uh, somewhere in the future, Mexico perhaps being added uh, to this. So I can't appreciate um, the uh, challenges of data development in Mexico and to what extent you can get subnational uh, estimates. But that should certainly be sort of on your horizon in thinking about uh, these things. This is again rags to riches movement in Canada and the United States where Canadians are placed in the American income distribution. Okay? Um, and uh, you can sort of look at this and your, your first question, or at least the first question I ask myself is, does the border matter? All right. And uh, I just sort of want to pursue uh, 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 this theme. But why does this statistic have prominence in our discussions? And I don't think it should be. It should have. And this is the other thing I mean by a judicious. It also requires us at this stage to be very agnostic. And we need to hold more than one thought in our minds when we're thinking about upward mobility which uh, I think is the major public policy concern. Uh, we don't have full guidance from theory on this. Uh, we have some intuitions from policymakers, and we need more discipline. Um, and again, Richard Reeves has emphasized this. If you're concerned about rags to riches mobility in a relative sense, then it seems to me that you also have to be concerned about the intergenerational transmission of privilege. People can't move from the bottom to the top if there isn't some give at the top, if someone doesn't move down. People can't move from the bottom to the top if it's impossible to bust out of poverty. So you also have to be concerned about the intergenerational cycle of poverty. 
uh, if you really want to, uh, to, to speak to the concern that policymakers have about upward mobility. That involves talking about incomes. So we are interested in income mobility. And we have this standard regression to the mean model that tells us that the predicted income of the next generation on average is going to reflect the absolute mobility of that cohort. It's going to reflect the average income of their parents in the communities they grew up with. And it's going to uh, reflect that, statistics we pl that statistic we've placed so much emphasis on, the intergenerational elasticity. All three of those things are of concern to us. We should focus on incomes. We should also focus on position. And I'm borrowing this equation from uh, the, the, the Chetty, Saez, Hendra, et al. Uh, paper where the lowercase values now represent ranks. And we saw the percentile transition matrix. The percentile rank of a child will depend how much kick overall that cohort gets in absolute rank mobility and how much kick they get from their parents' uh, uh, background, both absolute and relative uh, rank uh, mobility uh, uh, matter. And finally, as I suggested earlier, we should care about particular cells in the transition matrix. The rags to riches movement from bottom to top, the intergenerational cycle of poverty when people move from the top and stay at the top, and the intergenerational cycle of, 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 of poverty. So that gives me, uh, what have we got here? What did I do? That gives me a total of eight statistics. All right? And so I'm going to be very agnostic and just mash all these things together. And uh, let the algorithm decide how those communities should be uh, clustered. So I'm going to apply machine learning to the thousand regions of Canada and the United States and cluster communities according to a metric uh, derived uh, on standardized versions of each of these statistics. I can't say which of these weights more, but they should all be taken into account. And so one particular rendition of my uh, results of this unsupervised machine learning is a picture uh, like this. Now the colors don't mean anything. It just, the colors just mean that that is a cluster in which, and this, this set of four clusters are the set of clusters that minimize within cluster variance, all right? So if the major concern about intergenerational mobility in the United States is what's going on in the southern part of that country, as is very clear from the series of papers done by Raj and others, Canada shares that with the United States, all right? Um, and in particular, certain aboriginal communities in the northern parts of the country are excluded from the mainstream of our country. You can see that intuitively in their human capital development. You can see that in their access to education, health care, and housing. And you can see it in how they fit into a broader national labor market. Now, part of that is wrapped up with identity and trying to square um, uh, uh, cultural identity in a, a, a mainstream. What's different between Canada and the United States? In Canada, I'm talking about a maximum of 2 to 3% of the population, probably less. And so the weight that the, United States, the southern United States has in the United States, that kind of community, that kind of problem, doesn't wag the overall statistic in Canada, okay? That's one thing that comes out of this picture. The other thing that comes out is, in some parts of this geography, the border does not matter. You can see in the Midwest this bleeding from all the way northern Alberta into Texas a very, of a very common cluster, okay? And this, if you remember the Chetty graph, is a high mobility cluster, okay? It's also interesting that Alberta oil was originally um, developed and settled by Texas oilmen, all right? So when the Texas fields started drying up, they moved north. And there's a certain cultural commonality uh, there, all right? And these are sort of frontier uh, cultures. 
where we're not afraid of mobility and a sense of independence, and there's a certain amount of ethnic homogeneity in, in this space. In that space, the border doesn't matter. The border does matter if you look closely, and I, and I hope the graph is big enough, where the two countries' populations are centered. In the northeastern United States, along the eastern seaboard, you have nothing but red, but along the Windsor-Quebec City corridor, north of Lake Erie, north of Lake Ontario, and along the, um, I don't have a pointer in this, do I? Do I? How do I, how do I, uh, oh, okay, okay. I'm talking right along there, all right? All right, that's the heartland uh, of uh, Canada. All of the population is basically, well, boy, people are watching this in Canada on the web. Not all the population is there. It's not the heartland. Uh, <laughs> Toronto is not the center of the universe. <laughs> but it does have a population of four million. Or I think it makes Toronto close to what the population of Chicago is or even a bit bigger. So if you're talking about what moves intergenerational mobility in these countries, it's what's happening there. And that is very different than what's happening in New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Vermont, okay? Why is that, all right? I suspect, and this is the avenue for future research, it's got something to do with the structure of labor, uh, labor markets. To be in the top 1% in Canada, you can do it if you make just a shade over 200,000 uh, Canadian dollars. That does not get you into the top 1% in, in Manhattan. Okay, so there's a lot more polarization and inequality in labor markets in the United States than in Canada. That has to be sort of part of the story, not simply uh, early childhood develop development as important as all of uh, that is. So this is a comparison between countries, uh, but also within them, that I think is more uh, can add more fruit to policy discussions as this literature uh, moves uh, forward. So let me then leave you with the question, what will we learn from social mobility research? And that will depend upon how we learn about social mobility research. Uh, I want to argue as much resonance that the uh, uh, changes through time have for policy discussions, that there's still an important need to con pursue comparative research. Uh, that should be done be both between and within countries. And I should emphasize, already there is a Swedish study that looks at uh, the variation of mobility within Sweden. So I see this as an important uh, direction for research. When we make these comparisons, we should always do that judiciously, particularly as empiricists, because we don't have full guidance as much as we'd like uh, 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 from theory. But we can, do, uh, we can and should explore how people feel about this whole business, and how about, about values about how outcomes and process figure in to uh, individual and social welfare. As I've argued, how we will learn about social mobility will proceed if empiricists get more guidance from theorists on this. And finally, um, I just want to uh, argue that uh, I think all of us as researchers really do need to pay more attention, and this is just an add-on, to uh, constructive communication strategies. I, I have been extremely astounded and impressed by, as I said, about how this research, well-constructed research, has influenced the public policy discourse. But this research, and any research, empirical research, um, doesn't close this discussion. The numbers always leave a good deal open. And it's also astounding to me how our research is interpreted, reinterpreted, and misinterpreted according to uh, preconceived uh, notions. And we should also be engaged in that conversation because that three-legged stool of theory, of data, and uh, of policy uh, ultimately has to support constructive communication. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, Miles. Um, and now is your turn for Greg.
Thank you. Um, what I'm going to talk about here is some research that was in my book from 2014, but a lot of it about stuff that's developed uh, since then. And uh, in some sense, I'm going to be an unwelcome guest at a social mobility conference because a lot of what the book emphasized was about how limited the possibilities might be for actually changing uh, rates of social mobility. And uh, the book uses surnames as a shorthand way of estimating social mobility over m multiple generations. And so, for example, in England, the Norman conquerors, who were the first to introduce surnames, uh, about 0.5% of the population uh, still has uh, the names of, of the Norman conquerors, so we can actually follow what happened to this elite over something like 32 generations uh, within England. Uh, and so surnames are just a shorthand that allows us to look over m mobility in some societies over many, many generations. And as with many things, this idea is actually not original. <laughs> Uh, the uh, credit, as far as I can tell, belongs to Nathaniel Weil in 1989, and if you look him up on Wikipedia, you'll see that he led an extremely uh, colorful life, including a, a role in the Alger Hiss trial. Uh, and I think he was almost 100 when he wrote uh, this book and went from communism to supporter of the South African regime. Uh, but he did have this idea that surnames can encapsulate a lot in terms of social mobility, that they carry information about the movement of mobility. Uh, now, let me just give a very concrete example, and I've chosen Sweden deliberately because on conventional estimates, uh, Sweden has very rapid uh, social mobility. And what's interesting then is to say, well, what if we turn and look at the surname structure in Sweden? What would that say about underlying rates of social mobility in Sweden? And we can get several classes of elite surnames in Sweden because Sweden has a very active and uh, lively aristocracy still. Uh, and they're divided into two classes of aristocrats, the counts and the barons and the untitled nobility. And it also has a bunch of people who have Latinized surnames such as Celsius, which were the names adopted by people who went to university in the 17th and 18th century uh, when they would drop the name such as Anderson, the common names, and then take on this new mark of their social status. And so we can actually pick out amongst Swedish surnames then these two kind of elite sets of surnames that were formed in the mainly by 1800. And as I say, Sweden is interesting because of this fact that it shows up on Miles' uh, diagram as an exemplar of very rapid uh, uh, income mobility uh, now. And uh, this is the house that keeps the records of the aristocrats in Sweden. Uh, and so, as I say, they, we have very good records on who belongs to these families and who doesn't in terms of surnames. And we also can see that these formation of these noble families was largely complete by 1800, because by then Sweden had gone from being an imperial power in northern Europe and a contender in various wars uh, to being uh, a minor player in European history. And uh, this was the period when a lot of uh, military contractors came in from outside and then were granted uh, ennoblement. And the aristocratic surnames are very distinctive. Uh, a bunch of them were formed by taking heraldic elements. And so if you know economics, you know that L Leon Hufford is a, uh, a well-known macroeconomist, <laughs> but from the Swedish noble background. Uh, and uh, and so, so those names are quite distinct. And then the Latinized surnames are the names that tend to be associated with Swedish scientists in the 19th uh, century and 18th century. Uh, and including Celsius uh, of the temperature measurement. And so, as I say, you have these classes of surnames. And then the nice thing about Sweden is that they're very open about social status. And so you can easily get information. Uh, they publish, private commercial companies publish each year people's name, address, and what their taxable income was, and up till 2008, also what their taxable wealth was. 
And so it's like a burglar's uh, handbook here. <laughs> because you can see that, you know, Margareta here, if you're gonna break into anyone's house, this is probably the person that you, <laughs> you want to go to. And so, um, and what's interesting then is that at the kind of rates of social mobility reported from Sweden now, if that was iterated generation after generation, then these noble names and these elite names would, would look like the average person in Sweden now. There would be no difference because we're talking about uh, eight generations later. What is very interesting though is that if we just graph, this is for Stockholm, income as a function of name, the noble names are distributed, heavily concentrated in the upper end of the distribution. Uh, the common names such as Anderson are at the bottom of the distribution and then the average suite is here. And these are quite subtle differences, but they're still there in terms of these noble names. There's plenty of the noble names down at the bottom. There's also no, uh, a preponderance up at the top. And what we can then actually do is by taking an elite group such as doctors in Sweden from 1890 to 2011, where we have good records of who was in that group, we can calculate how overrepresented these elite names were, the titled nobles, the other nobles, and the Latinized names. And you can see that even now in Sweden, people who happened to 200 years ago have this aristocratic background are more likely to be a doctor. <laughs> and they're regressing towards the mean. But when we calculate what the implied underlying correlation is, it's something like 0.72. And so the surprising thing you see on this surname data is that a society that seems to have, on the income measures, very, very rapid social mobility also somehow still has a, an underlying structure where mobility, there's an underlying long-run mobility which is much lower. And we, as I say, we can do this for attorneys in Sweden, physicians, university students, academicians. We can look at different periods. And one of the things you see is that going back 1700 to 1900, rates of social mobility there are not that much higher, <laughs> sorry, lower. The, the, the correlations are not that much higher than they are from 1950 to uh, 2012. And so what is, and this is just reflects a general finding of these surname studies is that societies seem to exhibit typically a high kind of long run underlying rate of persistence, an intergenerational correlation of status of about 0.7 to 0.8, and that there's little variation across societies and epochs. That modern Sweden does not have mobility rates and for this underlying measure that are that much higher than they were in the 18th century, and medieval England has the same rate of social mobility as England in 2015. Uh, and so as I say, this is a surprising kind of uh, persistence, surprising constancy that are showing up in the surnames. And here's some data from 1950 to 2012. And so here's the reported income, intergenerational correlation of income. And then for the same societies, estimates of the intergenerational correlation of status. And as I say, the, all these numbers are quite high, including China, <laughs> uh, which had a communist uh, revolution. Uh, India is particularly high, uh, but that may be related to uh, mar marriage patterns in India. And once you actually see this in the surname data, we can actually go back to individual histories, and it actually becomes very clear that it's representing something important about family histories. And so Darwin, we know all of his great-great-grandchildren because of the curiosity of the English about the, their intellectual elite. Um, and he had 27 of these, and 11 of them are notable enough to have Wikipedia pages or Times obit devoted to them, <laughs> uh, and they do everything. Uh, a bunch of them don't have his surname anymore, and I come from an economics department that would pride itself as being in the top at least 30 in the United States. Uh, myself and my colleagues are much less distinguished than Darwin's great-great-grandchildren. <laughs> just of this accident that they're related to Darwin. And so it turns out that, as I say, it, it, it's an English society, but it seems in a lot of societies, there's a surprising lineage persistence of status, even when measured short-run mobility rates are high. 
And the question is, uh, what is happening here? And, and what we, we can propose is that for every person, there's a kind of a status phenotype, which is your measured status at the current moment. But then some kind of deeper underlying status that you carry <laughs> that you not, may not even be aware of, <laughs> but that is related to the history of your lineage. And that what's actually happening is that that genotype is being transmitted, that status genotype is being transmitted very strongly across generations. But at the level of actual outcomes, you can get a much looser link because the status genotype is just linking loosely to the phenotype in each generation. And so that it's possible then to get a society of a lot of short-run mobility, but a surprising long-run mobility. And what's actually happening here is for elite families, if the children do poorly compared to the parents, there's a prediction that the grandchildren will bounce back. <laughs> and it turns out in these lineages, all of your relatives are predictive about your social outcome. Your cousins, your uncles, <laughs> your great-grandfather, your great-grandmother, they all actually contribute information about what your likely outcome is going to be. And so somehow we're embedded in a much stronger lineage than you might imagine. And the puzzle then is, what is it that's transmitting this kind of deeper underlying status that we seem to carry? Is it family resources, culture, social network, or could it actually be genes that are transmitting that? And the surprising evidence is, and this is rehearsed in the book, is that a lot of status transition must be genetic. And the real debate is, is it between 50% and 100%? Where does it go to lie in terms? And that actually also means that the possibilities of changing social outcomes may be much more limited than people thought. And so, as I say, you could look at the book if you want to see the various things. But here I just want to talk about one interesting feature, which is about the patterns of inheritance. Um, if there's additive genetic transmission, so that means that, and, it, and there's a huge number of genes that are contributing to people's actual social status, as would be the case with something like height, then you get very clear predictions about what the correlation will be between all of the different relatives in the lineage. And these correlations were actually derived by Fisher in 1918. And there's a very clear pattern that you know the single parent to child will be h squared, which is the hereditability of whatever measure of status we have, times 1 plus m over 2, where m is the genetic correlation between the parents. And then siblings will have that same correlation. And it goes all the way down, second cousins, it's h squared, and it's always just h squared times 1 plus m to some power. And so this is actually, as I say, it's a very simple kind of model of genetic transmission, but it has actually these very powerful implications about what you should expect to observe. And some of these are actually quite surprising. So the fact that sibling correlations are the same or on this model as parent-child correlations is actually very surprising if you think of status as being socially transmitted. And just to give a very concrete example, you know, I was one of four children. We were treated identically by our parents. Uh, we should have a pretty high correlation. If I look at my, my childhood and my father's childhood and my mother's childhood, those were completely different social environments. And so you would think that the sibling correlation will actually end up being much closer uh, than the correlation uh, between parent and child on social mechanisms of transmission. Uh, and so one of the things we can, uh, and so what we're actually in the process of doing is setting up a database to actually look at the multi-generational transmission of status. And we can track people in England from 1750 to 2016 choosing people with rare surnames so we can actually track them through the records. And so we can get about seven generations of people here. And then we have multiple social outcomes. We have wealth, occupation, educational attainment, lifespan. And then from the electoral register, we can figure out their house value in 1998. And the sample of the database looks like this. right? We just have all of these different family lineages, where, as I say, we know the entire history of these uh, families. 
And here's one simple feature. What's the correlation of father and son versus brothers on various different measures of status? And what you see is occupation is the thing that correlates most strongly, but it's the same correlation, father, son, as siblings. And it's pretty true for all of the different measures of status that we can find here. And as I say, it doesn't prove anything about genetic transmission, but it's a surprising consistency with this simple additive genetic model. And this is also would be true of height correlation. The height correlation between siblings is the same as the height correlation between each parent and the child. Okay? And so, as I say, it, it's a bit surprising with this model. And then, as I say, we can just calculate all of these different correlations. And one thing that's very clear in this lineage is just the incredible persistence of status over many, many generations. When you've got third cousins, they're effectively seven steps apart in genetic terms. But they still have a significant correlation in our database in occupational status and also in wealth. right? And so the data is actually showing, as I say, within England, this very strong underlying persistence. Uh, and even if the, the measure doesn't transmit that well between generations, it still then tends to persist across many uh, generations. And then we can just draw a graph here. This is the wealth of people in England at death. And on the horizontal axis, we have the genetic difference between parties. And on the vertical axis, we have the log of the wealth correlation. And the prediction of that simple additive genetic model would be that all of these observations would lie on a straight line. And the R squared of that line is something like 0.95. And so it actually fits surprisingly well. And then you get people like nephews and great-grandsons who are genetically the same distance apart, showing the same correlation. And then from that slope, we can calculate what the implied long-run intergenerational persistence here is. And that correlation is about 0.79. Okay? And so as I say, it, it's, you know, the data here, it's, it's intriguing. Uh, it doesn't show, prove anything. But it does show these surprising patterns uh, that are consistent. And then another one we can look at is what's your house price? This is 1999. And now we've even got down to the level of fourth cousins, who are nine steps apart. <laughs> and again, you get this pattern. The only thing that is not consistent here is that you're getting a different long-run intergen you know, intergenerational correlation. And that's, you know, if this model was, abs was correct, you would expect to find the same intergenerational correlation, but some of that may be just sampling error. And one of the features of this, of this correlation is that it's only possible genetically if there's a very high degree of assortative mating in terms of genes. And the existing data on assortative mating seems to suggest that you just don't assort that much. Because if you look at things even like education, the correlation is only 0.5. And if we think that people are actually sorting on that correlation, in terms of the underlying genetics that determine, in part, the amount of education people get, you would think the correlation would be much lower. Because if you're sorting on what's observable, then what would actually be unobservable would be correlated even less. And so as a one concern here is that this is only possible as genetic transmission with a, dis a very surprising degree of uh, assortment by couples. But one of the things we can do, unfortunately in our data, until quite late, women don't have an independent status. And so we have to measure their status by looking at their uh, husband uh, and, and comparing that to their brother. Uh, but what will happen is if you look at things like higher education and you look at the, the OLS correlation of the brother and the husband, it's not that high. However, if you switch and look here at wealth as an IV or occupation as an, instru as an instrumental variable, what happens to these correlations in the data is they always become very high. And so the data seems to be consistent with the idea that people are matching on some deeper underlying characteristic, not just the observable features that we're seeing or any single observable feature. And so the data is actually consistent with the idea that there's some kind of deeper matching going on. Now, part of this with upper class families, maybe it's lineage meets lineage, <laughs> and it's Downton Abbey, right? But we also have a lot of people who are at the very bo bottom of the social scale here as well. And so as I say, it's interesting that you cannot reject the idea that at the minimum, 
uh, genetic transmission is actually uh, quite important. And so uh, the conclusion here is that in some sense, in terms of the, where research in social mobility would really productively go, it seems to suggest that you need to pay a lot of attention now to lineage and to these multi-generational uh, transmission mechanisms. And that the, the measures that we can look at just between single generations may not convey that much information about the long run social mobility process. Uh, and that these multi-generational uh, measures would actually allow us also, with this data in England, we can also test other features that would rule out our uh, genetic transmission. So one thing, for example, is that it's always the case that your relatives predict your social outcomes. What if your relatives are dead by the time you're born? <laughs> do they still predict, and do they predict as strongly? And the answer in this data is yes. It doesn't matter whether they're alive or dead. What if, about if they live 200 miles away? How strongly do they predict then compared to the ones that you live in the same village as, or the same town as? And the answer is it makes no difference. <laughs> Right? And so there's actually lots of tests we could do here that would actually check, you know, is there real social transmission going on? Or do relatives really just convey information about what the underlying status of individuals is, where the underlying process really is just genetic transmission between parents and child, or the dominant process uh, in uh, here is. But as I say, in terms of uh, what have we learned about social mobility, I take one of the messages here as being that it's really these, these multi-generational data sets uh, that people are constructing now. Uh, Joe Ferry and uh, a group from Gothenburg in, in Sweden that really will have a lot to say about the processes of social mobility. And uh, as I say, it's still unclear why these lineage effects are so important, but it should be a very productive area of research to try and figure out what do you get from your lineage, right? And what is it that yeah, you, you, you've been handed? Uh, and as I say, uh, there, there are these connections between you and people five and six generations ago. There are, you will never have met your third cousins, <laughs> or, or very likely, unlikely to know them, but you're surprisingly connected to this other group of people out in the world. And as I say, that I think will be a productive area of research in terms of the possibilities of social mobility, the mechanisms that underlie social mobility, and, and, and also how much low social mobility represents a social failure as opposed to just a transmission of aptitudes and abilities across generations that are surprisingly strong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. So uh, we close this first session with the presentation by Andres Bjorklund. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have um, used the title Intergener Intergenerational Income Mobility and the Role of Family Background. And the reason for that is that I want to stress that uh, um, a simple focus on mobility might hide a lot of important family background factors. So I, I prefer this uh, way of looking at the problem and the results I'm going to show will illustrate this. This is actually also the title of uh, a survey paper by me and Marcus Gianti published, I think, 2009. So we want to stress uh, uh, this uh, fact about family background. Uh, I have two main messages, and the first is that mobility estimates do not reveal the full influence of family background. Uh, so they tend to us underestimate the degree of inequality opportunity uh, uh, in society. Uh, I, I think that's uh, 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 an important message that I hope that I can uh, convince you about. Uh, a, a second minor one, it will not take up very much of my time, but uh, uh, at the end, I will also stress here that if you consider interventions uh, during childhood of, uh, uh, and with a purpose to promote social or intergenerational mobility, it actually takes like 40, 45 years until you can estimate the impact on uh, income mobility because we need to measure income at ages 40, 45 or so. So 
Uh, I think it's also very important to have other indicators in mind to, to follow up such interventions within a shorter period of time. And I also have at least one illustration of, uh, of this message at the end of my presentation. So I will first talk a little bit about intergenerational income mobility. And I will claim that they reveal quite much mobility and suggest actually substantial equality opportunity. But sibling correlations reveal a much stronger impact of factors that siblings share, which is family and neighborhood. Uh, so one can say that there is a gap uh, between uh, the intergenerational estimates and the sibling correlations. Uh, then I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, what I prefer to call the equality opportunity approach to, to, to these issues. And uh, I think it is in the spirit of John Romer very much, uh, which is more of a multivariate approach to the role of family background. And I think there are some interesting results. And I have some for Sweden that I'm going to show. Uh, but uh, this approach has not been able to fill the gap that I mentioned. So that remains the, the big challenge for future research. And I hope I can convince you about that. So that's, this is what I will talk about. And uh, I will obviously start with intergenerational mobility. Miles has already defined these uh, common measures. Uh, you have long run income of, of a son in uh, most frequently, and long run income of a father. And you have an elasticity uh, that you estimate. Uh, you can also focus on the correlation. Uh, which could be useful if there are changes in income distribution between the generations. So uh, uh, I have also noted that one. And then there are also many rank-based measures that, have, uh, uh, that Miles also talked about. Uh, so uh, I, don't have, uh, I, I will show, show them as well. So what, are, what is the background here that uh, Anne Miles showed? Uh, you hear that uh, if you look at this great Gatsby curve, the intergenerational elasticities are somewhere between 0.15 uh, and 0.50. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is a very interesting result, but I don't think it's very new for you, so I will not really focus on that, rather the, on the magnitudes, 0.15 to 0.50. Uh, what about the uh, correlations? There we don't have as many estimates for technical data available reasons, in my view. Uh, so that's more of an open question. But uh, it would be surprising if they are very different from the L systems. So all in all, this means that the R squares that we talk about here, which actually is the intergenerational correlation squared, or from 2 to 25%. And that's, I don't think, is very much. Uh, so that's the background. And I also illustrate this here with Swedish data. Uh, I think this is a figure and also a, a label that contains quite much information. We have used seven year averages for sons and parents. It's total income, including capital income. Uh, and. Uh, if we do that, we get an elasticity of 0.265, which is very close to what people have estimated uh, before and in general. Actually, the correlation is quite much lower. And uh, at the moment, I don't have a, a, a good explanation of that. Uh, but uh, the fact that, and of course, the square of that is like 2%, the square of 0.153. And then we also have the, uh, this figure where I have the rank of parental income on the horizontal axis and the uh, rank of offspring income on the other one. And uh, there are 40 times 40 squares in here, so 160 altogether. And if this relationship would be deterministic, uh, I would have 2.5% uh, density on uh, along the diagonal here, but that's not the case. So the observations are all over the place. So looking at data this way, one really gets uh, quite much mobility, except in the very top, 
so you can see here that the, the linear slope 0.216 here is the linear rank correlation slope. Uh, but if you estimate that non-parametrically in the, in the top, there is quite much action. So the relationship between parents and offspring in the top is very much different. So it's, it, it's not uh, a good idea to, to make general statements about mobility from what we observe in the very top. So, and it actually, I, I also have a paper where we look at uh, the extreme top uh, of the distribution and there the slope is really, really high. So I think this, these numbers and this figure illustrate my points that actually when you look at data like this, there is quite much mobility. Uh, for schooling, here it's, um, I've taken this from a very good paper by Hertz some years ago, uh, but I don't think that the new estimates that are around will uh, change the picture to any extent. The correlations here are a bit higher, between like 0.30 and 0.46, I think. Uh, so that's a bit higher probably, and the difference between the regression coefficient and correlation is quite big also, which is not surprising because from one generation to the next, inequality of years of schooling, of course, changes a lot. So uh, here I repeat my results that the income associations are not that strong, uh, and education associations are um, only slightly strong. <coughs> So that's the background, and uh, now I then turn to sibling correlations, uh, which actually is a variance component exercise. So here the uh, model is that the outcome Y has one family component A and one individual component B, which is the deviation of siblings uh, between uh, uh, the family mean. So A is common to all siblings in the family, and B is unique to the individual. And uh, um, when data are constructed that way, uh, they are orthogonal by construction. So the variance is the sum of the variances of these two uh, components. And uh, the family share of the outcome variance turns out to be this row, which can also be interpreted as sibling correlation. But it's actually the, the ratio there that I find very useful. It is like an R square. It's the, the fraction of total variance that can be accounted for by the family component. Uh, and this captures more than an intergenerative correlation because a sibling correlation captures, uh, what th this uh, is actually a um, some, uh, an expression that is uh, shown formally in Gary Solon's survey paper many years ago, but actually one can show that the sibling correlation is the intergenerational correlation squared plus other shared factors that are uncorrelated with, uh, a parental, uh, with the parental outcome that we are interested in. So it's an omnibus measure. It captures both observed and unobserved family background and neighborhood factors. Uh, but yet it is a lower bound for family background because all family background factors are not shared by siblings. Some family background factors make them different. And that's also what we inherit. And it's potentially a, a, a source of uh, inequality opportunity also. So uh, it is a lower bound, but uh, 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 it still captures more. And here I have some estimates. Um, there's a lot of Björklund et al. there, but uh, there are fortunately also something by Dan Schnitzlein from Germany, and Bash has also estimates. Uh, I have two estimates for Sweden, and I believe more in the higher number in a more recent paper than in the first one. But these are now R squares. It, it, they should be given the interpretation of R squares, and they are from like 0.49 for the US to and the lowest is for Norway, and uh, uh, I don't really know why it is that low, but uh, we got these numbers when we estimated them. So uh, that's what we have. 
Yes, a schooling, there they also are quite many uh, estimates around, and they are also a little bit higher from like 4, 0.40 to 0.66. Uh, so, and they should also be interpreted in terms of R squares. So, how much do the mobility estimates explain here or account for? So, how large is this gap? And then one can use this uh, expression that I showed that the sibling correlation is the square of the correlation plus the other stuff that is uncorrelated with parental income. And I have some Swedish estimates. Uh, to illustrate, if I would pick results from other countries, they would be uh, uh, give, give the same picture. So you can see here that out of the sibling correlation, other factors clearly dominate. So this gap is actually quite large. So there's very much more that siblings uh, share and capture than uh, uh, the intergenerational estimates. Okay, fine, yeah. Uh, now these numbers are, are um, uh, still quite high, but they are only lower bounds, as I said, so what is missing? And one could argue that full siblings have only about half of initial genes in common. I add initial because of these epigenetic ideas that genes can change over life. Uh, but each individual has actually 100% of her genes from her parents, so that must be imply and underestimate uh, uh, of the role of family background. Uh, it's also the case that not all environmental experience and shocks are shared, only some. So some environmental stuff is obviously misleading, missing. If they go to different schools, uh, parents have different income uh, when an older, uh, for an older and a younger sibling, and so on. And uh, we also have differential treatment by parents. And uh, that will not be captured if it creates differences. But it's, as I said, part of family background. So would it be possible to raise this lower bound with one could ask the question, could one instead use MZ twins? And that is, of course, good in the sense that they share all initial genes. Uh, they also share more environment and more shocks. And that's also good for this purpose because they have grown up with the same parental income, the same uh, neighborhood and so on, whereas siblings of different age uh, uh, are different in this respect. So I think this is an advantage if you want to capture the full impact of family background. But it might be that MSET twins interact more and affect each other in ways that have no counterpart in the general population, and that is, of course, not good for this purpose, so maybe what you get from MZ twins is an upper bound, but not necessarily so. Uh, so I also have some numbers here just showing that the correlations for MZ twins are much higher. So now maybe they are a bit too high to capture everything, but uh, not, not necessarily. So it might be actually that uh, the, the total impact of family background is uh, uh, far above 50 percent. So uh, would it be possible to raise the lower bound for differential treatment? There I have one argument about birth order, but I'm waiting with that until uh, some illustrations later on. So if I sum up this here, uh, it, uh, I should say that sibling correlations reveal a large role for something in the family. Uh, but the unobserved factors seem to be most important. And of course, there, can be, there are many candidates to explain that. Parental skills uh, uncorrelated with parental income, sibling interaction, genes, and so on. So um, uh, this is uh, what I have to say about siblings. So, and now I turn to the third approach, which lives its own life in the literature, in my view, which I think is very unfortunate. And I blame those who belong to, 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 to both sides here for this fact. We can talk more about that later. So this is uh, the, a, a very simple way, a, a very stylized version of the, what I prefer to call John Romer's approach to equality opportunity. 
And uh, the idea is that it does not give full justice to that literature that has a lot of very nice ideas in it. But for my purposes here, I think it's enough. So uh, the idea is that uh, the outcome that we're interested in, that could be long-run income or something, uh, depends on circumstances C, which are factors beyond individual control, and individuals should not be held responsible for, for, for these uh, variables. And of course, children cannot be held responsible for parental resources. And then we have effort, which could also be a, 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 a set of variables. And that's more, uh, they represent justifiable inequality. And uh, then you get a reduced form where you see that the uh, outcome uh, depends on, on uh, circumstances uh, uh, according to the equation there in the bottom. And how is this implemented? Well, the very simplest way to do it is to estimate the reduced form that I showed. And then you use that equation to derive the inequality that is generated by circumstances. And you compare that inequality with total inequality. So you get a share of inequality that is due to circumstances. Uh, uh, and one can, of course, also look at the R-square. To, to, to measure this. Uh, there is a claim in the field here that this is a lower bound, and uh, I don't want to go into a discussion about of that. And here I also say that uh, there are other finesses in this literature that I will not come into. Uh, are there pros and cons here? I think this is, I really le like this way to think about the equality opportunity problem. It's, it's a very systematic, thoughtful way. And uh, the, the first advantage here is that it recognizes that the inequality opportunity cannot be measured by one single socioeconomic status indicator, which we use in intergenerational mobility research. Of course, it's much more that is uh, something that violates equality of opportunity norms. Uh, one can also very easily with this approach include multiple measures of socioeconomic status. I really like the idea that income, occupation, and education capture different aspects of resources that parents have and that are useful for, for the children. So it's very straightforward here to use different ones. And one can actually also use, look, uh, use information about mothers, which is sometimes uh, missing otherwise. It's also straightforward here to include grandparents uh, to get a more general intergenerational mobility model. Uh, so grandparents, is, it's a natural candidate as, as a circumstance with this approach. I don't think it has been used uh, before, though. Yeah. Uh, one can also, and I think this is a finesse, one can include factors not shared by siblings, for example, birth order. Uh, so you can use that in this equation and see what happens. And the sort of mating can be uh, uh, in, uh, included, and uh, one can also here be flexible about the measure of inequality. I'm going to il illustrate that. It, it's not necessary to use the variance. One can also use uh, any <coughs> inequality measure that one prefers. There are also all, um, uh, cons of this approach. Ideally, this should be a multivariate causal model, and that, of course, we don't have. And uh, uh, it mainly also, uh, uh, it cannot account for the unobserved family background variables as the sibling correlation approach them. So um, here I have some illustrations uh, of this approach. Uh, and um, uh, on the first row here, I show overall inequality of uh, long-run income. It's actually exactly the same data set as the, uh, as the colored uh, figure that I showed with the, the, all the me measures of inequality, uh, of uh, mobility. So if you then look at model A here, it is actually the, what I showed before. So the R squared to the right, 0.023, that's the intergenerational correlation square. Uh, and to begin with, I think we should focus on the R-square column. And then 
the, the B line is only that I measured income in levels instead, which is not a big deal. Uh, I, uh, in C, uh, I also have a more nonlinear uh, specification, and a little bit happens. Then in D, I not only use parental income, but I add parental occupation. This like, I've forgotten exactly how many indicators it is. I think it's six or seven. And parental education. And it, for education, it's both mothers and fathers. And there one gets some action. So that seems to be important to some extent. So the R square increases from 2.6% from to 3.8. And that is uh, a bit. So, but now to be clear here about the, what is done here and what is done by you, Greg. Here, I, on the left-hand side, is income. But on the right-hand side, now I have added to income also uh, uh, occupation and education. So that seems to be a, a bit important. Then I also uh, add grandparents' education. It's actually only two grandparents here, but uh, it's about what is used in other papers. And in the underlying equation here, it's significant, and the, the coefficient looks like what people have got before, but nothing happens to the R square, at least uh, with three decimal points. So it's not very important. And actually, on, in the published multi generational papers for Sweden, I have looked carefully uh, for the R squares that are reported there, and they are never reported next to each other, but if you look at different pa places, uh, I can see them. And there actually something happens on the third decimal point, but not on the second. So th this is actually what, but people are extremely excited that the mobility equation changes, grandparents are significant, but it's not an important additional source of inequality opportunity according to this result. And I think that's quite important. Yeah, and then I have the birth order, which is something that makes people different, and in the underlying equation, it's significant, but it doesn't mean much either. And then at the end, I have the own IQ and non-cognitive skills at age 18. And this idea also comes from John Romer, namely that the skills you get, you have when you enter adulthood is not something that you should be accountable for. That's something that you have been given from your parents. But when you become adult and responsible for your actions, then it's different. Now age 18, I think it's too high, but it's for data reasons that we have. But then we actually get some uh, action here. So we get 8%, so that seems to be important. <laughs> and by far the most important factor here. And uh, I think that is quite important. But still, the 8% here should be compared with the sibling correlation, 25%. So it's still very little, so we haven't solve the mystery. So I think the, this illustration uses richer data for the equal opportunity approach than most other studies, but we still don't come close to the sibling correlation. It doesn't fill the gap that I talked about. So it, this last uh, result that motivates my second point that I started with, that uh, childhood interventions to promote social mobility take 40 to 45 years to evaluate if you want to do it the, the conventional way. But I think that data sets that gives important um, uh, uh, important skills at the age around 15 or 16 and family background. I think that's some of the most important <coughs> data sets one can use here. And that's of course the British cohort data. Uh, and we don't have that uh, as much of that in Sweden, unfortunately. So uh, I have, I think I've already said uh, I'm out of time, that uh, uh, the, the gap has not uh, been filled by this approach, even with these quite rich data. Uh, it is possible in the future to use more richer variables. And uh, here I have an example. Actually, I think that genetic information fits the framework of the rumor perfectly, because that's a um, that's, um, circumstance. You cannot be held accountable for your genes. And in the future, one can think of having that as uh, 
explanatory variables. So what have we learned? Well, this may be summarized as what I said. Intergenerational income associations are not that strong, suggest much room for individuals' opportunities. Sibling correlations reveal a much larger role for family and neighborhood background, and yet it is a lower bound. And I don't rule out that the MZ twin estimates are quite informative, actually. And there is a gap between IGM estimates and the sibling correlation that we don't understand, and I don't want uh, I, that, that I, for me, it's top priority to understand that. Uh, and this equality opportunity approach addresses the underlying question in a good way, but it has not been able to fill this gap. Uh, and uh, 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 so far. So I think that in order to learn about the degree of inequality opportunity in society, we need to learn what is in this gap. Maybe it's primarily stuff that people are responsible for, but after all, people do not choose their siblings. They are not responsible for their siblings. So I, lend toward, uh, I lean toward the view that what is shared by siblings is a circumstance and a source of inequality opportunity. Sorry, I used a few more minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.